Uh, it's truly an honor to be with you today. I think one of the things that excites me is there's so many people in the room today that have had a positive impact on our industry and our world. And that's really the two things I want to talk about with you today is our industry and what we can all do to improve the world we live in. I think one of the things we talk about at our company is that change is clearly underway in terms of an energy transition globally. At Semper Energy, we believe that there will be more change uh, in the next 20 years than we've seen in the last 100, right? And uh, this isn't something we as a leadership team back away from, nor do I think our industry should back away from it. I think we should do the exact opposite and lean into it. So one of the key takeaways from my presentation today is that uh, I am personally very optimistic about our industry over the next 20 years. I believe that the 21st century will be the century of energy, and I think the United States in particular will have a big role to play. So let's jump right into it. I plan to talk about six things today with you. I'm going to give a brief update on some of the transformational issues that are impacting Semper Energy. Uh, second, uh, I'm going to talk about what I think is a unique moment in time and use a comparison to a historical period where a lot of change occurred. Third, I'm going to talk about four trends, or what I refer to as the four Ds that I think will shape our industry over the next two decades. Fifth, I'll frame what I believe is our industry's call to action. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about leadership, because I think leadership framed in a global context will lead to the innovation and new ideas, inventions, I think, that will help shape our industry. So let's start by talking about Sempra. In the last 18 months, we've made some pretty important decisions, I think, that have been transformational for our company. We've set out to simplify our business model and sharpen our focus really on the markets we think are most important that can make the biggest impact for our stakeholders. Uh, that's led to some important decisions about selling certain assets. We've exited our North American position in Central Station Solar and Wind. We currently have two divestitures pending in South America. Today, we're the largest electricity provider in Peru. We serve the city of Lima. We're also the third largest electricity provider in Chile. Uh, both of those assets are currently under contract to sell to two different Chinese companies for $5.8 billion. And part of our decision was the opportunity to recycle capital back here in the United States where we thought we had better growth opportunities. And our focus here in the United States has been on uh, three markets, California, Texas, and Mexico. And, and part of our focus has been some of the analysis we looked at with some outside consultants is by 2040, the three states in the United States will account for 80% of our population growth, Florida, Texas, and California. So by focusing on California as a core market, we serve 25 million consumers there, their basic gas and electricity needs. That's the fifth largest economy in the world. We serve 11 million consumers in Texas. It's the 10th largest economy in the world. And we're quite bullish on Mexico long term. Mexico has 130 million consumers. Today, it's the 15th largest economy in the world. And that we believe by 2040, which is the period I want to talk about today, they'll move to number seven in terms of GDP. In addition to constraining our geographic focus, we also took the time to focus inside the value chain where we thought we could produce the best superior risk-adjusted returns. The core of our focus is on transmission distribution uh, investments, particularly in the markets I just described to you. I, I think today we certainly have a more strategic platform that we believe we can scale our business and deliver cleaner, more secure forms of energy to our customers. And then the final component of our strategy has been to make sure that we're being thoughtful about reinvesting in a high performance culture. Over long periods of times, I think that it's the ability to attract and retain the best employees, and we've got 20,000, uh, make sure that we have a recognition culture. This can create a competitive advantage for a company over a long period of time, and this is something we're very focused on as a company. So let's do this. Let's have a little bit of a stretch our imagination a little bit and look back into a period of time that has been completely fascinating to me personally. I'm going to start in the middle of this timeline and talk a little bit about the 15th century, which was the age of discovery. Some folks refer to this as the age of exploration. But if you will, imagine a moment in time where the leadership of Western Europe believed that the world was flat. And if you sailed far enough across the high seas, you'd sail off the edge of a flat earth. But there were a small number of people that actually thought differently. I think we might refer to those folks today as entrepreneurs, primarily led by the Portuguese and the Spanish. Uh, they raised money. Uh, they received royal sanctions. They invested in the latest sailing technology at the time, which was wooden caravel ships that had a very uh, low draft, 
so they could explore rivers and estuary areas. Uh, and they hired crews and they set sail with the sole purpose of trying to find a new world. And at the time in Western Europe, there was a belief that there were three co continents in the world. And what they found was not just a new world, but four entirely new continents. And the thing that really strikes me is, imagine a moment in time where every map in the world was wrong. Every map in the world known to man was wrong. If you go back to 500 BC, you can see that Pythagoras had hypothesized that the world was round. It took 2,000 years from hypothesis to proof, right? It was Magellan, 1519, three-year voyage that circumnavigated the world. And it wasn't until the 60s that American satellites actually measured the circumference of the world. But if you take that 2,000-year period, Pythagoras to Magellan, just give me 1% of it. Give me 20 years. What can we do from hypothesis to proof in 20 years as an industry, right, to better support our world? So I would submit to you that perhaps, just perhaps, we're in a new age of discovery, right? And, and that age is really about what folks in this room do, what we as an industry do. So what I'd like to do next is talk about why that I believe that energy is so fundamental to modern life. Uh, if you take food production, housing, transportation, manufacturing, biotechnology, to space exploration, what we do in our industry is powering a number of important things in the world. There are profound challenges facing humankind, including the task of modernizing the world's energy infrastructure, energy infrastructure and lowering our carbon footprint. And I think Chris gave a very important call to action in his last presentation as he talked about the crossroads that's in front of both the developed world and the developing world. But let's take a moment to think about some of the things that have taken place in the last 200 years. The world's population has grown from about 1 billion in the 1800s to about 7.7 .7 billion today. And just in the last 30 years, actually I could even argue 15, we've been going through an energy transformation, right? I mean, Central Station Solar, Semper Energy built the first largest Central Station Solar project in 2008. It was 10 megawatts. Right today, building a 500 megawatt central station solar project is not a problem, and it's very price competitive. Uh, I would also say that uh, we were one of those com companies in 2005 that were completely convinced that we were running out of gas, right? We built two regas terminals here in North America, and we were so wrong that we've almost proven ourselves right now because we really have a cost advantage to actually turn those into export facilities. But in 15 years, we've gone to large-scale central station solar. Frackings come on the horizon, right? Horizontal drilling. America, in the last three years, has gone from being as now the number one in oil production and number one in natural gas production. Who would have predicted that in 2005, 2010? So I think there's always this argument that you have to have pride in your past in order to have confidence in your future. And certainly as an industry, if you look at the profound changes, the technological advancements that have taken place in the last 15 years, it causes us to have some form of optimism. Now, the thing that challenges is things don't remain static. You know, so going from 7.7 .7 billion people, by 2040, there will be 9 billion people in the world. But I would also comment that energy not only has provided access to opportunity, but it's lifted billions of people out of, out of poverty into the middle class. Think about it today that every second that we sit here, five people in the globe are moving into the middle class. And why is that important? Two-thirds of global energy consumption today is accounted for by the middle class. You can also see on this slide that energy and the innovations around it in healthcare have led to dramatic increases in life expectancy. So going back to the 1800s, and I'm glad I don't live in that time frame, the average life expectancy was 29 years. Today, globally, which is remarkable, average life expectancy is 73 years. So with uh, growth in and access to energy innovation, I think that we should expect that opportunities and innovation will accelerate in the future. One of the things that interests me here is that 88% of the world today has access to electricity, 56% has access to the internet. And why is that important? Extending the metaphor from the 15th century a little longer, it was the Gutenberg press at the time in the 1400s that expanded literacy rates in Europe. It's the internet today in a very similar way that's expanding access to information, 
and education to the world. So our ability to allow more folks to have access to electricity, more folks th can then have access to the internet, it has a really positive impact on our society, and it really highlights the importance and the enabling power of, of energy. And I would make a comment here that uh, part of the challenge we have in front of us was actually very well covered by our prior speaker when Chris talked about the crossroads we're at. Most of the focus tends to be on what we can do in the developed, in the developed world. And clearly, uh, the United States has a role to play, right? We're going to move away from a traditional reliance on traditional fossil fuels, uh, battery technology, natural gas, renewables, part of that mix. But part of the challenge is incremental energy growth between now and 2040 will come from the emerging markets. 90% of all incremental demand will come from the developing world. And that's really important because they're moving to have access to more oil and natural gas, but at the same time, we got to make sure that we can help diversify their energy supply. Uh, one example uh, is China. Uh, today, China's greenhouse gas footprint is more than twice the United States. And what's remarkable, if you fact check this, is that their greenhouse gas emissions from coal combustion only are uh, w one third more than the overall United States greenhouse gases. So there's a lot at stake here, right? So for OECD countries, we've got to make progress, right? It's partly as energy efficiency, consume less, find more sustainable and secure forms of energy. But it's just as important that we as an industry are focusing on the global energy transition impacting the, uh, the emerging markets. That's one of the reasons why China's consumption of natural gas between now and 2025 is expected to increase by 60%. And if you go all the way back out to 2040, the time frame I'm focused on, 70% of all natural gas consumed in China, we believe, will be provided by LNG. So let's talk a little bit about some energy trends. Uh, I refer to these as uh, uh, the four Ds. Uh, the first and most important one, I think, is probably digitalization at our company. We rolled out a brand new customer information system in Texas in November of 2017. We're putting $300 million into a new CIS system at San Diego Gas and Electric. The Southern California Gas Company will follow, really revolutionizing our interface with customers. At our electric utilities, we're focused on falling conductor technology, capacitors, ultra capacitors. There's been a huge expansion of electric battery storage in California. So this idea that the digitalization of our economy is also dramatically impacting how we provide gas and electricity service is really a focus for most of the companies in our industry. Second, on the topic of decarbonization, I think the key takeaway here is that folks tend to think that there's some form of prescription, some form of formula that should be overlaid for every market. And the fact of the matter is, every market has a unique indigenous advantage relative to energy. So let's talk about what we're seeing, because it's occurring in different ways in different markets. In California, they have a 60% renewable expectation by 2030. Chris was kind to note that as early as 2017, our electric utility in California passed the 45% mark. So think about this. San Diego Gas and Electric today has 12% of all of its customers served by rooftop, leads the United States. Beyond what's produced by rooftop, 45% is uh, produced by renewables. I was on a phone call with the electricity community of the World Economic Forum earlier this week. We had a gentleman on the phone uh, who leads one of the large utilities in India. And they were talking about the fact that they're trying to get to 10% renewable penetration, but they're having a hard time stabilizing the grid, and that 50% of all incremental demand in India will be met by indigenous coal, right? Well, think about where California is, right? We're already shooting to have 60%. At our company, we think it's possible by 2025. So part of our challenge is making sure that best practices and economies of learning can be shared across the industry and across companies. I would also mention in, around the topic of diversification. Uh, we've got a $10 billion investment in Mexico. Uh, today, there are 17 international high-pressure transmission lines for natural gas between the two countries. We own 11 of them. We own 40% of the gas transmission system inside of Mexico. It is incredibly important because today, it is America's largest trading partner for natural gas. We move seven Bs a day to Mexico. And what's taking place is they're moving off of fuel oil to create electricity in their power generation sector to natural gas. 
So decarbonization is being impacted in Mexico with American natural gas. By 2024, they've set a goal of 35% renewables, uh, which is you know, a pretty aggressive target, and we're participating in that process as well. I would also mention uh, that uh, in Germany, they've set a goal of 45% by 2030. So they're moving more away from nuclear and coal. Similarly, in China, China expects to be at 16% renewable penetration by 2030. Actually, many people think they're on track to do much better than that. Some people have even circled a number of 26%. So it's not all about renewables, clearly. I think there's going to be renewables with a mix of load-following natural gas. But what I'm trying to convey is that each market is going through its own unique process of decarbonization, and certainly the diversification is really important. On the diversification front, our analysis shows that 80% of all electricity capacity that's built between now and 2040 will come from renewables. And that's a really, really big commitment. So it's going to be the lion's share of all new capacity additions in all markets will come from, renewable, from renewables. Uh, lastly, I'll mention uh, the last D of discoveries. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in our closing. But <clears throat> just like we couldn't have forecasted the large-scale renewables that we see today in the United States in 2005, we couldn't even forecast the potential impact of fracking and horizontal drilling. I think we have to be open to the idea that innovations and inventions between now and 2040 will make a big difference, whether it's passive nuclear systems, whether it's moving away from 1960 battery technology, which is only incrementally improved, whether there's opportunity, as Chris mentioned earlier, around hydrogen. I think we're behind in America on hydrogen at the Southern California Gas Company. We're in very much engaged in Japan and Germany about some of the new revolutions that are taking place in hydrogen. A lot of what will help our industry between now and 2040 will come from, from new discoveries. So let's talk about a little bit about uh, some of the challenges of growing population. Chris talked about this a little bit in his presentation. I think there's around 1.2 to 1.2 um, billion people in the world that have uh, insufficient access to electricity and energy. We call this energy poverty. There's uh, a group of folks that have no access to electricity, and there's a smaller group that has access to electricity on a more intermittent basis. And if you look at the studies of how they use that electricity, most of them use it to charge a, a phone, right, in the emerging markets, because that phone provides a lifeline to the world, a lifeline to information. I would also mention there's another 1.6 billion people that are really facing some form of economic water shortage. So as you think about the world's population not staying static, it's going to move from about 7.7 .7 billion to 9 billion by 2040. This puts a unique set of challenges on our industry, right? There will be issues about meeting the basic needs around access to clean water, solving issues of energy security, food security, and continue issues around economic and social equality. And one of the things, as I think about this, I always like the, uh, the African proverb that talks about that if you want to go fast, go by yourself, right? But if you want to go far, go together. And I think part of the message today is not just my personal optimism about what we can accomplish as an industry, but my conviction that we can accomplish a lot more by doing it together, sharing best practices and economies of learning. So let's talk about what some of the advances that we expect to have happen between now and 2040. I refer to these as my seven power priorities. I talked a little bit about battery storage. I think you'll continue to see uh, tremendous advances in this area. I think most of the technology out there today is really 1960 technology. You've seen some process improvements. We think you're going to see a revolution around battery storage. That's important for renewable integration. Much like the CEO talked about in India, they've got grid stability issues, even at 10% penetration. The role of natural gas and batteries will allow for deeper renewable penetration across the globe, market by market. We've talked about renewables, energy efficiency. Let me speak for a moment about decarbonization, particularly around transportation. So remember, what's unique about electricity is it's a derived fuel. It, don't think of it as a primary fuel like oil or, or natural gas, right? So as you change the feedstock to electricity, you can reduce its carbon content. In the greater San Diego County today, when we chronicle the stack of our greenhouse gases, over 54% is related to transportation. So when I was running SDG&E in 2016, we started this huge campaign to have a race to 500. We wanted to be the first business in Southern California that had 500 employees 
that use electric vehicles exclusively as their primary means of transportation. I'm pleased to say we're at 710 today. We've set a goal now for a race to 1,000. Over that same period of time, the San Diego community has gone from 20,000 electric, uh, electric vehicles. Today, there's 50,000 in San Diego. And we have a goal of having 150,000 by 2025. If you electrified every transportation vehicle, light, light duty truck uh, and passenger vehicles in greater San Diego County, it would increase electricity production or demand by 5x, right? So the opportunity for electricity as a fuel to be decarbonized and start competing favorably uh, with other transportation fuels is a real opportunity. I think you will not get at the issue of cleaning up and, and, and defeating some of the changes taking place around the climate without addressing transportation. I'd also say for those folks that saw the last few slides in Chris's presentation, the biggest challenge, if you really want to impact this two degree issue, is getting after the large truck, the light duty truck, and the passenger vehicle area. Uh, finally, I would make one more point on this slide, which is to talk about hydrogen. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. You know, we serve 22 million Californians of basic natural gas needs at the Southern California Gas Company. We are committed to hydrogen. Uh, it has an opportunity to take that from water and also separate it from natural gas. This is an absolute priority. So if you think about opportunities for R&D, uh, alpha and beta projects, we expect to do a lot more of this in the next five years. So as I wrap up today, here's what I'd like to leave you with is I think we have the opportunity as an industry, not just at SEMPRA, not just in the United States, to deliver a more sustainable energy system that supports the needs of a changing world. And uh, I've heard some people say one time when they talk about the future, everybody needs to understand the future is not determined. It's not some outcome of a predetermined historical process, right? There are a variety of futures in front of our industry. And the future that we deserve is the future that we actually choose, right? We have a choice in this process. And I think one of the things I've thought about is, you know, public policy has an important role. Clearly in California, they've set very prescriptive targets about what should happen with renewables. In the state of Texas, they double the renewable pro production of California without prescriptive regulation. So there is certainly a role for uh, public policy, but I'll tell you what I think is more important and more lasting is the value of ideas and innovation that come from our industry backed by the capital markets. What we do is what matters most. And I think certainly every country has a role to play. But what I'd like to do is conclude with a conversation that I had with one of America's leading technology CEOs. And we were having a conversation around what's allowed America to have exceptionalism in so many areas, particularly around technology and innovation. We started talking about perhaps in some small way it has to do with how our country was founded. For the last 400 years, there have been people landing on the coast of this country with an unconstrained view of opportunity. And I think in some small way, that frontier spirit that was part of the founding of America has influenced college education, it's influenced risk taking, it's influenced the development of some of the world's best companies. So if what we're facing over the next 20 years is about innovation, if it's about invention, if it's about new ideas and technology, I think there's an argument that it's not just the century of energy. This has the opportunity to be American century. And I think we as a nation need to rise to the calling to participate in solving some of the world's greatest challenges. And it starts with making sure we take a concerted leadership role in the energy transition. I would conclude by saying I am very optimistic about the future. Thank you very much.